to the part in the story that um, there's difficulty. And so we, we talked about this morning how God positioned, really prepared Esther to become queen. Now, now remember, we talked about this morning, this is the most powerful kingdom on earth at its time. Uh, and it tells us in chapter 1, there's 127 provinces. So it kind of creates this picture. It also shows you how much wealth there is. It says the king is able to throw a party for 180 days. As if that's not enough, he throws a second party for everyone. While that's going on, his wife's like, oh, I'm going to throw a party as well. So the whole point of these parties is, as scripture we looked at this morning, is to demonstrate how well off, how much they've accomplished, how wonderful, and it's just extravagant. <clears throat> now, so this morning we talked about how the king requested for his wife to come so every one of the men could all see how lovely and beautiful she was, and she refused. By her refusing, she lost her position as queen. And so a decree went out, and all these women were gathered. And Esther grew up an orphan, raised by Mordecai. Really a broken situation. Mordecai, who has been exiled from Jerusalem himself, and you have these two kind of broken people who have experienced pain in their lives. And this opportunity, all at this point that we really know about Esther is that she's beautiful. And she has the favor of God, and she becomes queen. And that's really where we kind of ended the story this morning. Now, there's something that happens, and it's almost a footnote, but it says about Mordecai that what Mordecai would do especially in that year that Esther was being prepared for her moment to see if she would be queen. It, scripture says that Mordecai would go to the gates and he would kind of pace back and forth. And I'm sure it was worry and praying and do we have any news? Does anybody know what's going on? And that was kind of his thing that he would do, this kind of pacing and praying and inquiring and checking out it's in that place that he overhears a plan to overtake the king. This is not a godly king. Mordecai is subject to that king. That king rules a kingdom that displaced God's people. So Mordecai, here's a plan from two individuals who say we want to overthrow the king. For Mordecai, there had to be a part of him that said, I'm in. Yes. There had to have been that part. Because, again, this kingdom displaced them from their land. Yes. They're one of those provinces that has been taken over. But Mordecai hears this. And he reports it. And these two men are caught and they are killed for their plot to overtake the king. It doesn't make sense to us. Now, when I studied this, they're like, well, Mordecai, similar to David in the Old Testament, would not betray <coughs> King Saul. Even while Saul was hunting him down to kill him, David said, no, I will be defended by the Lord. And there was something about listening and obeying God even when it didn't seem to make sense. Like, for us, it made sense for Mordecai to be the third conspirator. Like, that seems to make sense. But something in Mordecai said, no. And so he turns them in. Now, Scripture kind of pauses there. It pauses, and then it gets back to the story. And it introduces another character, Haman. Haman becomes the second in command. And this is in chapter 3. So Haman is now second in command. Now, this goes right along with the story, just like the king. That's right. 
So, so Haman in chapter 3. Now, there's no law. It's not been decreed. It doesn't come from the king. But it becomes the practice that whenever Haman would enter in, people would bow to him. They would bow to him and show him honor and reverence. Now, it wasn't a decree. The king didn't make it a rule. It just became the thing or the practice or the tradition at that time. And Mordecai refused. Mordecai, who hung out right by the gates, was there all the time for Esther is also positioning himself to where Mordecai, I'm sorry, Haman comes and he goes right in front of Mordecai. And everyone's bowing. It is obvious. It's obvious that Mordecai is just standing there. He's standing there in defiance. I bow to no one but the Lord. Yeah. And I can pause for just a second. No matter what's going on in culture, no matter what's going on with your coworkers, students, no matter what's going on at school, no matter who it is or what the situation, you bow to no one but the Lord. Amen. Now listen to what happens. Haman decides, I'm taking his life. But Haman says, I don't want to just take his life. I want the destruction of every single Jewish person. Yeah. And it says they cast lots and they come up with a plan. And scripture gives the date. It's in December, months away, that they're going to plot and plan and manipulate the king to kill every single Jew in the land. And church, I want to remind you of something. When you're going through opposition, when you're going through criticism, you have a family member, it doesn't matter what you say, they're just upset with you. When you have a coworker, you're like, I don't understand why they don't like me. I tried to reason with them. I tried to explain my situation. Maybe you have a neighbor, and when you see they're outside, you don't want to be outside. And when you're outside, you hope they don't come outside. And you don't, you, you can't understand why it's like that now. And it's just, complete opposition. Listen, they're not against you. They're against your God. Culture would love to silence you, but they really want to silence the church. And so this is what happens. Haman comes up with this plan, and he manipulates the king, and the king agrees to it, and the decree goes out. And back then, when a king made a decree, he could not undo it. So the king says it, and they say the date. And this is when not only Mordecai, but every Jewish person would be killed. And in this story, Mordecai finds out, chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap and ashes, and he went out. <clears throat> so in private, tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and then he goes out into the city. He's crying with a loud and a bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing these clothes of mourning. And as the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, it's months off, there was great mourning among the Jews. Listen to what they did. They fasted, they wept, and they wailed. And many people lay in burlap and ashes. And Esther <coughs> is in Son, hears about Mordecai on the outside. <coughs> now Esther was seen as beautiful, the most beautiful person, a favored person. 
And she was able, because of her beauty and the favor of God, she was able to enter where nobody else could. And she became queen. And I want you to see the picture now of Mordecai. Mordecai tears his clothes and he puts on burlap and ashes and he's making a fuss. He is openly weeping and crying. And Esther says, send someone to him. Tell him, be quiet. Tell him to cover up. She sends clothes for him to change into. And so they go and Mordecai says, no, as a matter of fact, tell Esther it's time. And they go back and forth. And Mordecai says, have you not heard? Do you not know from your place what is about to happen? Esther's clueless. She has no idea. And the king doesn't understand that his queen is a Jew. He doesn't know they withheld that information. The king has no idea he condemned his wife to die. And Esther hears this news. And she says, but there's nothing that I can do about it. There's nothing I can do. I am not allowed to just go up to the king. I am not allowed to walk up to the throne. I can be killed for that. And she says, do you not remember the previous queen? She's not in a position anymore because she said no once. And she said, I can't do it. And here's what Mordecai says, the scripture verse that we all know. And he uses the word perhaps in several translations. I, I love that. There's a story in the Old Testament. Jonathan is at battle. This is Saul's son, Jonathan. And he's looking out. And he has his armor bearer with him. And there's a whole army, and it's Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he looks and he says, Perhaps if we go down, you and I, perhaps if you and I go and fight them, we'll be victorious. You want to go with me? It's like, wait, we're, we're acting on a perhaps? <laughs> We're acting on a, on a maybe. And here we are, Mordecai says, perhaps the Lord has positioned you for such a time as this. You have to decide if you're going to be obedient. And listen, she has to think, Mordecai, we've made it. I didn't know my mom and dad. We had no money. We're servants for these people. We don't even have our homeland. Now I'm the queen. Now I live in luxury. Don't mess this up. Like we can pray, but don't ask me to sacrifice everything. I didn't know the song Rachel was doing tonight. But listen, everything you have is from God. And listen, I say this, I'm not telling you to do it, I'm saying us, let's do this. Everything we have is because of him. Yes. Everything I own, every gift I have, every ability I have, it's from him. Yeah. It's not me, it's not mine. Perhaps, we should take everything we have and say, God, do it now for such a time as this. Esther was like, no, no, look where we're at. Mordecai, you don't have to dress like that. Mordecai, stop it. She does not know what's going on. She doesn't know. And Mordecai says, remember, you're a Jew. There's a price on your head as well. <coughs> I I heard a I heard a message several years ago. 
and it was from a young man who was at a youth service. He said he was a, a Christian at the time. He was a, he was a believer, um, but he said, I didn't, I didn't really read my Bible, didn't really pray, and, um, but he's like, I love, I love the Lord, and, you know, consider myself a Christian. And he said, we, we, had, we had a good size youth group, and we were in one of our youth services, and he said the youth pastor was up and he was speaking, and the youth pastor had a rose. And he said, I, I, the size of our youth group, he's like, there were a lot of kids in our youth group that were not Christians. They just came. You know, boyfriend of them, girlfriend of them, I like hanging out with them, and um, came to the youth group. And this, this youth pastor had a rose. And the youth pastor said, this, this rose represents you and how God looks at you. And it's, it's beautiful. You know, a rose is it's beautiful. It's, it's lovely. But the youth pastor said, but I want you to listen to me. Every time you sin, every time you make a decision to sin and not follow God, it's like taking one of those petals and tearing them off and you lose it. He said, that's, that's what sin is. Now, you sin once. You know, the rose is still there. You probably can't tell that, that it lost a part of what it was. And he said, but, you know, you sin once, and it just becomes easier to sin again. And you lose another part. And so God looks at you, and God sees you, but you're not totally complete anymore. You're, you're missing part of who you were called to be and who you could be. And, and he said, listen, teenagers. He's like, the music you listen to, you're, you're tearing off a part of what God has for your life. And it's the relationships that you're in, you're, you're tearing off a part. And he said, he said, listen, the, the things you say about each other have a fake flower. He said, listen, you're, you're, losing, you're losing a part. And he got to a part and he said, listen, he said, if you're in a relationship and it's not a believer, and you're doing things in that relationship, you're, you're losing parts of yourself. And he just continued to talk. Now as he's talking and as he's doing this, this young man says, sitting in the back of the shoot room, and right in front of me is a girl. And he's like, She's not been a youth group before, but I know who she is. She goes to high school with us. And I know she's dated several people in her school, and word goes around, she's been in several relationships. And, and as the speaker continues, and one by one, he's saying, you keep losing pieces. You keep losing pieces. You keep giving yourself away. And, and look, look now. He's like, look at that rose now. It's hard to even tell it's a rose. You've made so many mistakes, and you've made so many compromises, and you gave yourself away to so many people, and you've done so many things, and you're so young, and all these different, and he's holding it up, and he holds that up, and he's like, look, that's what you've done. Look, and as this youth pastor is speaking, this girl comes undone. Tears just start to stream down her face because she's had sex with several guys. And yes, she's went to parties and done things. And she didn't grow up in church like everyone else. And as the youth pastor says, look, look how God sees you now. Look how everyone sees you now. And this girl can't sit still. She can't sit still. She's just sobbing. And it's such a large room that the youth pastor has no idea. And he just keeps going on and going on and, and holding up a flower that's not pretty anymore and can't be put back together. And he just keeps going on and on and on. And this young man who's sitting behind this girl is starting to get mad. Something in him is like, that's not right. That, that, that's not right. That's not how God sees us. That's not how God sees us. 
and he's wanting that youth pastor to shut up. Everything in him. It's like, that's not at all. And this youth pastor says, I want to take this twig and pass it around this room. Who would want that? Who would want that now? Nobody would. You have become worthless because you made compromises. You have become worthless because of the things you've done and the people you've been with and the decisions you made. And this girl is falling apart. The weight of condemnation and shame and guilt all crashing into her at one moment. And that young man on the back row stands up and he says, Jesus still wants it. It still has work because Jesus still wants it. And that young man today pastors one of the largest churches in our country. And he said, at that moment, I was called into the ministry. And I decided every week I would stand up, preach the word of God, and preach against yeah. nonsense that's saying, you messed up. You messed up. You messed up. All your potential is scattered, and that's all you are now. And listen, Mordecai says, Esther, we came from nothing. And look what he's done. But Esther, it's not for you. It's not for me. It's for our nation. Yes. It's for everyone. And Mordecai is standing in a place where he knows the hurting of the people and he has access to the queen. He's standing between those two worlds. And he's saying, you got to hear their cry. Yes. You've got to know their loss. You've got to know their brokenness. You've got to see complete destruction is at hand. And you've got to move in church. You are Mordecai. You are a person who must position yourself in a place where you stand between the broken and you stand between the Savior. And you say, God, do it now. God, you've got to do something. God, you've got to reach them. God, you've got to do something beautiful. And listen, I'm willing to surrender everything. I'm willing to give up everything I have for them. And that youth pastor in the back of the room said, I will never be the same again because I've seen the effects of telling someone you're worthless. I've seen the effects of taking all of our mistakes and stacking them up so big that you no longer can see a way to the cross. And listen, our position is the opposite. He has positioned you for something beautiful. And listen, I don't know what it is. We've had in the last few weeks, we've had a couple people that have raised their hands to begin a new relationship with Jesus Christ. It is beautiful. I said a prayer several years ago, and you're now linked to that prayer. I said, God, please give me the opportunity, give me the privilege to stand up and preach to as many unsaved, unchurched people as possible. I prayed that prayer about 10 or 15 years ago, and I pray it all the time. And listen, church, we will be a church that prays and begs and fasts and pleads with God and cries out and says, God, fill our church, fill my grove with unchurched, unsaved people. Give us the opportunity to stand between the hurting and the Savior and say, God, join them together. God, I thank you tonight. I thank you that you position us. For Esther, you positioned her through a blessing. You gave favor on her and you blessed her 
And so you put her in a lofty position. For Mordecai, it was heartbreak. Difficulty. And God, I pray. I pray whether we feel right now in our lives that we're walking under favor. Maybe we feel like things are blessed in our life right now. Maybe we feel like, God, so many things are going right. And maybe we feel on the other side, we say, I, I don't know how to get past this. I don't know the answer to this. God, I don't, I don't know how this is going to turn out. God, I, I don't know how things are going to go well here. God, I don't know what to do. And maybe you feel like you're in a season of struggle. <clears throat> And no matter what spectrum you feel like you're on, God, we say to you tonight, will you use us to minister to hurting people around us? God, we surrender our brokenness to you. God, we surrender our success to you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the boldness that we will not relent. We will not stop declaring hope to hopeless situations. We will not relent of shining light in dark areas. We will not relent to give, to serve, to pray for the nations. <laughs> we will not give up. The need is huge. We do what we can, and we believe you, God, to do the impossible. And God, I pray. I pray for First Assembly of God. God, I pray for our church. I pray over this whole campus. I pray that you would fill us with hurting, hungry people that are unchurched, unsaved. And God, you would do a move like we've never seen. Yes. God, you would do something that would far surpass everything we prayed for and everything we've hoped for god we ask you i sense it myself god it's like a holy impatience saying god please do it now god we prayed and we believed and god at times we felt weary in that but god we ask you will you do it now god there's too many hurting struggling people in our community we will not be still and we will not be silent in jesus name Amen. 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 Will you stand up tonight? Just take a moment and just close your eyes. that's in here that says, I don't feel either one of those things. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll give it to them. I pray that you will put an urgency and excitement in our hearts. Holy Spirit, pray that you would tune our ears to hear what you're saying. You would open our eyes to see what you want to do. You would give us the grace and mercy to walk it out in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.